Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I, can, uh, if I can have your attention. We still have some people coming in and being seated, but uh, by my eye, we've, uh, we've reached a, a quorum of, starts, of sorts, uh, so we're going we're gonna to get started. Uh, we want to make the most of the time we have uh, with our distinguished guests uh, tonight and get as many of their insights out for your consideration. Uh, we are talking about uh, one-sixth of the American economy, which if it were a separate economy, would be one of the largest economies in the world all by itself. Uh, and we are talking about uh, an issue that probably more than any other in public policy discourse truly touches the real lives of every single uh, American. So good evening and welcome. As most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. I want to start by thanking um, Dr. Clasco, uh, you Lavery, the entire team uh, at uh, Jeff uh, for hosting us tonight. Um, uh, Jefferson uh, is a long-term and very valued partner of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, uh, and tonight is just sort of the latest installment in that partnership. Uh, as you know, uh, this uh, program is the uh, last council podium event of 2017. Um, we really didn't have much to talk about this year. It's been quiet in world affairs. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, but we made do with what we had, and we, we did a program that spanned from the, uh, the colorful and spirited commentary of former president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, to the colorful and spirited but very different commentary of Anthony Scaramucci. Uh, and we covered many others in between, and we covered many parts of the world uh, geographically. Uh, after you have uh, enjoyed the holiday season, and of course we extend our best to you and yours uh, for the holidays, uh, we want you to come back and see us again next year as we launch in 2018 an 18-month observance of the Council's 70th anniversary. Uh, as we continue to be informed by the core value, I think, best expressed by Reinhold Niebuhr when he said, it is always wise to seek the truth in our opponent's error and the error in our own truth. This program tonight is the latest uh, installment in the Stan and Arlene Ginsberg Family Foundation Great Debates series. Our thanks, uh, as always, to uh, Stan and Arlene for their generosity and for our corporate supporters, Amatech, UGI, and SEI, who rose to meet uh, Stan's challenge to create this series. Uh, because of our panel being large and distinguished and our time being limited, I'm gonna dispense with formal uh, uh, introductions. Uh, we have uh, program books before you where you can read uh, much more background uh, about our guests, uh, but uh, uh, we will go more quickly that way into the substance uh, of things. The saga of American healthcare policy is an issue which has consumed more political energy and legislative time on Capitol Hill than probably any other domestic issue in the last generation. And as I said, it's an issue that perhaps more than any other touches the real lives of every single American. We're going to ask each of our panelists uh, in order uh, to make brief opening statements. Uh, then I'm going to pose some questions to the panel and then we will move to questions from you. Uh, as you can see, uh, you have note cards in front of you uh, and very recently sharpened pencils. Uh, we had to go get those. Um, on which you can jot your questions and staff will circulate uh, during the panel discussion to collect them uh, so that we can uh, make use of them uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, so without further ado, joining us this evening uh, are Dan Hilferty, the CEO of Independence Blue Cross, Dr. Stephen Clasco, uh, President and CEO of Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health. Mr. Mr. Michael Tanner, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute. Ms. Suzanne Garber, Chair of the Board and Co-Founder of Gauze and Adjunct Professor at Temple University's Fox School of Business, another partner of the World Affairs Council. Uh, and Chase Madar, uh, an author and civil rights attorney uh, in New York. Uh, you'll note uh, the absence, unfortunately, sadly, uh, uh, of uh, Emily uh, Gee uh, from the Center for American Progress uh, who had planned to be with us but who took ill today, has laryngitis today, and so couldn't uh, join us. Uh, we hope she's getting the very best of American health care uh, as, we, as we talk about it. With that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hilferty. 
Craig, good evening, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for having us, and it is so impressive what the World Affairs Council does across the board, and, and I, I believe the Philadelphia chapter is, is the best in the country, so thank you for, for thank your you. leadership. Thank you. Um, and um, Ms. Gee, I'm sure if she's carrying a, an independent Blue Cross card, she is getting the best uh, <laughs> possible health care that she can get. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I very briefly just set the stage for the discussion. Um, we have some things as a Blues, and in my role as president of Independence Blue Cross, and I just completed two years as chairman of the board of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Um, but I'm speaking for our organization, Independence, when I say, think of these concepts. Uh, healthcare is not democratic, it's not republican. Healthcare isn't a privilege, it's a right. If you start with those two tenets, those two foundational thoughts, uh, this thing is not insurmountable. You're right, it's 18% of gross domestic product. If unchecked over the next five years, we'll go to 25% of gross domestic product, mostly on the cost of pharmaceuticals. Um, but, but the truth of the matter is, we had a, a legislation that was passed, whether you're Republican, conservative, Democrat, progressive, we had something that was a start. It was called the Affordable Care Act. The truth is it should have been called the Accessible Care Act because over the last five years, 28 million more Americans are covered than were prior to the Affordable Care Act. It's not perfect, far from perfect. So whether you want to repeal and replace or just fix the Affordable Care Act, it has to be about knowing that 28 million more Americans, and if we continue on a path, either through the expansion of Medicaid managed care or through the ability to uh, get coverage on the exchange, we would have basically created a system that was a universal health care system. That's where it would be headed. So I think it's incumbent upon us as, as citizens, those of us in different areas of the healthcare community, to continue to push for a bipartisan solution that takes the best of the Affordable Care Act, understands that the best health care in the world is provided right here in the United States of America, and frankly, much of it right here in this institution. Steve, I probably need to say that, Jefferson, Jefferson Health System. So we need to keep pressing for cooler heads to prevail, for those who are willing to meet in the middle, find out a way to make Medicaid managed care sustainable, find out a way to, to make sure the exchanges continue to function in a way that more Americans are comfortable signing up, and in doing so, they will have the greatest treasure they possibly can. They will have a card, whether it's a card that's given by government or a card that's given by the private sector through a health insurer, a card that is there for them at their most vulnerable points in life. And I truly believe it's, it's doable. Uh, we continue to uh, talk about this on the, in the halls of Congress uh, with the administration um, to the extent possible, uh, and we'll continue to try to make universal coverage through these programs that already exist, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid managed care, the private sector, either through the exchanges, individual products, or through traditional employer based. It's a partnership between government, the private sector, both the private sector in terms of health insurers working closely with the center of the system, the individual, individual clinician who is part of great healthcare system. So I'm excited for this and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Please. I couldn't believe my eyes when I opened up the mail that day. I got a bill for $6,507 for a colonoscopy I was told twice was covered by my insurance. I thought there was some kind of a mix up until the other bills started coming in for pathology, for lab, for the anesthesiologist. $13,000? I called up the office and I said, how could this be? I checked twice. I gave you my card. I was here in person two times. Twice you told me I was covered. I'm sorry, you were out of network. Out of network? Do you really think that I would spend $13,000 to have a tiny little camera shoved at my behind? <laughs> oh, and by the way, the service date, <coughs> April 1st. <coughs> yeah, I guess the joke was on me. Incidentally, I was in the middle of filming my documentary, Gauze, Unraveling Global Healthcare. 
It took me to 24 countries where I visited 174 hospitals and I interviewed over five dozen international healthcare experts because I was consumed with the thought of best in healthcare. I wanted to understand how do other cultures, how do other countries determine what's best? Because for me, I could have a determination, but maybe that was something that was fed to me. I wanted to understand what other organizations and countries did. And so I used myself as a guinea pig in many of these countries. And I learned that healthcare, best in healthcare, comes down to four key criteria of quality, accessibility, affordability, and transparency. And I was really delighted that as I went to places such as Thailand or Singapore, I was able to get next day or same day appointments compared to here where I might have to wait a month or two to see my rheumatologist. And I asked my primary care physician, she's booking out until May to see new patients. So then when I was going around and, and getting various tests and exams and procedures done, I was really delighted to see that I was able to get the immediate appointment. I was able to get access to my records immediately, whether they were handed to me or in France, for instance, they actually uploaded them into an electronic repository where I could just <coughs> download them as any other French citizen could. On the price front, of course, we all know that the United States is much more expensive. And in other locations, I paid anywhere from a tenth to a half of what I would have paid in the United States. But interestingly enough, upwards of 90% of the locations I went to, they were able to tell me exactly how much something would cost before I had that procedure done. Something I would have really appreciated to know before I signed that consent form agreeing to pay for all of the charges. I certainly wouldn't have had that done had I known I would be responsible for the $13,000. Which is very interesting because when we look at the different costs around the world, there's, I want to bring up the example actually of Blumengrad International Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand that actually publishes a list of every single procedure and the range of costs that it could, it could cost the patient based upon actual utilization of patients. It will give a low and a high that ranges maybe 20 to 25% off of what you'll actually see. What's interesting though, compared to the United States, we see ranges in the hundreds to thousands of percentage points. And this is creating an issue with bankruptcies in America, where between 25 and 62% of all individually filed bankruptcies in this country, depending <coughs> upon which report you believe, whether it's a nerd wallet or Harvard or Notre Dame, they're because of, out, uh, of outrageous and excessive healthcare costs. So when we look at all of these factors in terms of best healthcare in the world, where is it? What needs to happen? Because I can assure you, for instance, here for everybody that's come to this event tonight, <coughs> you knew how much it would cost to fill your tank up with gas. You knew how much it would cost to park in the parking lot. You know how much it costs to attend this event. Why don't we accept this, the same level of, of quality from our healthcare system as well. So when I look at the best systems around the world, and I look at transparency, quality, access, affordability, the best systems in the world excel in all four areas. The United States is not there yet, and through a bipartisan cooperation of public and private, we can get there. Michael? How many, how many of you out there ever saw the, the movie Hidden Figures? Anybody, show of hands? Yeah. You remember the scene in the movie where they brought in the new IBM computer? Mm -hmm. And it, it took up an entire room, right? And they had these little punch cards and stuff to, to run it and all that. And they didn't talk in a movie about how much it cost, but it was actually a couple of million dollars just for that one computer, right? Today, I have a much better computer than that here in my phone. And it was free when I signed up for a two-year contract. Why? Because that's what markets do. When you have engaged consumers mm -hmm. and competing mm -hmm. providers, mm -hmm. you get better quality at a lower cost. Those don't exist in today's healthcare system. We don't have a market today in healthcare. What we have is a highly subsidized system. More than half of all healthcare in the United States is paid for directly by the government. And about 37 cents out of every dollar in health care is subsidized indirectly by the government. We have a system under which consumers are basically not paying for a large portion of health care. We actually pay 
less out of pocket than countries like France and Australia and, uh, and a lot of countries that we think of as having universal coverage, we actually pay less out of pocket as consumers than they do. And we have a country in which much of health care is regulated. Providers are restricted into cartels, in which there is very little competition, in which the barriers to entry are extremely high, both for providers and insurers. We have a system in which normal markets don't function. And if we could get more of a functioning marketplace, we could have the same thing happen in healthcare that happens in other goods and services. The second point I want to make, and I, I'm afraid there's going to be a little bit of disagreement here. We heard that healthcare is not a privilege, and that's absolutely correct. But then we heard healthcare is a right, and that's not correct either. Healthcare is a commodity, and it is a finite commodity. There are only so many doctors, so many hospitals, and so much money to go around. That's why there is no such thing anywhere in the world as a health care system that provides unlimited care to everybody. All health care systems ration care in some form, ours included. Some health care systems rush, ration by fiat. They simply deny certain types of coverage. In the UK, the National Institute for Clinical Effectiveness, for example, puts a dollar amount uh, on, each value, on the value of each additional year of life and if a new drug, for example, is being introduced and it costs more than 60,000 pounds but extends life by less than a year, that, mar that is not allowed on the market in the UK in order to save money. Other countries rationed by queue. Basically, you can have as much care as you want, but you know, there might be only one MRI unit in the province of Saskatchewan, so you might have a little bit of wait to get in to use it. And other countries like the United States rationed by price. You can have whatever health care you want is to, if you can afford it. All of these involve trade-offs between access, quality, access, and availability. We have to decide how we want to make those trade-offs, but we should never pretend that there is a magic unicorn factory out there someplace that's going to provide us with unlimited health care, and it's going to be free to everybody, and nobody's going to have to wait, and we're going to have the doctor of our choice. We're always going to have to trade off between those particular things. And lastly, I would just point out that access does not necessarily mean, or insurance does not mean access, access does not mean treatment, treatment does not mean health. That basically, if you have a marginal dollar to spend, paying it for more insurance coverage may not necessarily be the best way to use it. We do know, for example, on Medicaid, if you look at the Oregon experiment, that when they took, a, it was a random assignment experiment, they had an equal number of people they assigned to Medicaid and not Medicaid, and they've looked at health outcomes four years down the road and found no difference in health outcomes between the people who were uninsured and the people on Medicaid. They found self-reported health went up, but that self-reported health actually went up regardless of whether or not you had seen a doctor. So, uh, so it was sort of a, a placebo effect, if you will. But there was no evidence that simply providing people with coverage actually improved uh, the quality of their, uh, of their health nor did it actually uh, improve people going to the emergency room. It turned out people showed up in the emergency room actually more frequently once they had the Medicaid because now they knew it was going to be paid for. People did see, have an increase in utilization. It just wasn't necessarily quality utilization. People were going not necessarily for things they needed, but for other things as well. So I think that those are things to keep in mind when we start thinking that there's some sort of, sort of, sort of utopian answer to these things. There's always going to be trade-offs involved, and we're always going to have to make choices. Yeah, the only the only thing I'll comment on is don't don't mistake universal coverage for total access. Right. Don't Agreed. mistake it. I think that's important. <coughs> yeah. So uh, right before I took my job at Jefferson, and I also want to thank you for everything you guys do at the World Affairs Council, and I agree with uh, Dan that I really wish Miss D well, and if she has an IBC card and gets gets her care at Jefferson, that would be uh, that would be good. Uh, but. Um, so right before I started my job, uh, I gave a talk for the Aspen Institute, and he, there was an economist before me talking about the country's economy, and he said the two things you don't want to be running for the next five years are academics and health care. And I got up and said, well, I just took a job in academic health care, so obviously don't listen <laughs> to anything that, that I have to say. Um, and it really hit me, because I got a chance to spend some time at Apple in the year 2000. And sometimes, as I'm looking at this panel and I'm watching you, imagine if this panel was a group of software developers and laptop makers and gateway at, you know, in 2000, thinking incrementally and saying, gosh, you know, I need to get a better laptop and compete with Dell. 
or I need to get a better operating system to compete with Bill Gates. And then over in the corner there is Steve Jobs going, you know, I actually think none of that <coughs> crap matters anymore. I think we're going through a once in a lifetime change where we're going from a computer industry to a digital lifestyle. And I'm going to put my, I'm going to put my foot down. And by the way, I'm going to come up with something called 200 MP3s, which by the way, the Wall Street Journal said he's either crazy or on drugs. He was on drugs, but he was not crazy. It was the first <laughs> foray into a digital lifestyle. So if you think about that, we're going through a similar once in a lifetime event where healthcare is moving from a business to business to business to consumer model. And you know, I, I have an example, I've told Dan the story, but my daughter uh, has what I think most people will have insurance. She's a public health professional. She was down at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. She had $250 a month with a $3,000 deductible, starting to get away from OPM, other people's money. She makes about $60,000 a year. And I, I ran the academic medical center down there, which is where she was stationed. She said, don't worry, but I need a small procedure. And she asked me about a small community hospital outside of, outside of Tampa. What do you think about that hospital? I said, well, it's a good hospital, but you're right here in New York. She goes, yeah, I need a small procedure. And it's $200 of my money if I have it done at that hospital, and $800 of my money if I have it done at the place that you're at. I said, by the way, Dad, that's $600. That's a weekend in Miami, dude. And I said, well, I know that. But um, oh, one more thing. I went on healthgrades.com. They have the same grades. I went on leapfrog.com. They have the same amount of errors. Oh, Dad, one more thing before you tell me how great the university hospital is. I went on um, patientslikeme.com. Do you know the waiting rooms are cleaner and the staff is friendlier at that hospital than the place that you run? Uh, now, what do you want to tell me? That's the future that we're entering. So if you, if you want to think about this from a policy point of view, it's very hard to be non-political uh, the day after what happened yesterday. But I'm going to give you the, the most non-political statement you can say about the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act did exactly the job we asked it to do. For those of you who are there, I, I got a chance to interview Clay Christensen, and in his new book, Competing Against Luck, he talks about the jobs theory. What job did you ask a product or service to do? The Affordable Care Act did exactly the job we asked it to do. Gave a lot more people access to fundamentally broken, fragmented, expensive, inequitable, and occasionally unsafe healthcare delivery system. And then it hoped that the healthcare delivery system would transform. And, and when you think about it, it's not a whole lot different than when President George W. Bush got criticized the day after bombing Iraq and did mission accomplished. Uh, excuse me, there might be about 50 years of, of stuff you got to do. We did the same thing. We had President Obama, we had Nancy Pelosi and others saying we did what 15 administrations couldn't do. We solved health care. Oh, no, you didn't. You created a bill and you didn't do any of the hard work to solve health care. And by the way, this is not a futuristic con concept. One of my mentors at Wharton, a guy named Bill Kissa, and in 1965, he wrote a book that could have been written today, Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. And that's what he said in 1965. He said there's an iron triangle of access, quality, and cost. And he said if you remember your geometry, if you increase one angle, you gotta decrease another. If you ever wanna increase access, you either have to increase cost or decrease quality. If you wanna increase quality, you're either gonna increase cost or decrease access. Unless you fundamentally disrupt the system. He used the word disrupt in 1965. Oh, and you know what else he said? He said disruption is painful. In that book, he said, if anybody ever tells you they're going to increase cost, increase quality, increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it's not going to be painful, they're not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So let's look at recent politics. President Obama said, and I quote, the Affordable Care Act will increase quality, increase access, decrease cost, and it won't be painful. President Trump said, it's going to be huge, unbelievable, terrific, and awesome. But what he meant was, <laughs> we're going to increase access, increase quality, decrease cost, and it won't be painful. So if, if you really want to look, the Democrats and the Republicans are not that much far apart. We have a dollar to pay for a dollar and a quarter. The only difference between Democrats and Republicans, it's hard in 2017, the only difference between Democrats and Republicans, is that the Democrats want to just keep giving everybody a quarter. Give the providers a quarter, give the insurers a quarter. That's unsustainable. The Republicans want to just cut 20% of the people off. Nobody wants to do the disruptive hard work to do that dollar and dollar and a quarter. And I'll just give you sort of some examples. And by the way, it's all of us. It's when, when Senator Sanders says there's no civilized country in the world that doesn't make health care right, you could then say there's no civilized country in the world that doesn't make health care right that has the kind of pharma payment system we have where we can't negotiate with pharma. There's no civilized country in the world that makes health care right that doesn't deal with end-of-life issues. There's no civilized country in the world that makes health care right that pays their dermatologist 12 times what, they, what, what we pay our, our primary care providers and then ask our primary care providers to be quarterbacks. 
as my pr primary care providers always say, Steve, it's great that you want to be, me to be the quarterback, but you pay me like the kicker. You know, there, there, there's, there, there's, no, there's no civilized country in the world where they make health care right where we have exactly the kind of insurance system we have where the insurance is the middle person between the provider and the payer and, and the person that, that, that's getting the care. There's no civilized country in the world that makes health care right that has the kind of contingency system that we have. So, so if, 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 if you want to look at why, why we're not where those other countries are, it's because it's we're lazy. It's because we haven't wanted to do the hard work to go through those disruptors. And generally, everybody has said, what's going to be good for me, as opposed to making the sacrifices that you'd need to make to disrupt the system? What we need in a place like Philadelphia is a disruptive event that has everybody follow that. If you think about retail, <clears throat> I gave, just gave a talk at Wharton. When Amazon came out, and if you were Target or Walmart or Macy's, Sears and Penny's, there were three alternatives. You could say, I got to get rid of my store and I got to go and, and just be eat. You could be Macy's, Sears and Penny's and say, no, oh, that's a fad. That, that's nowhere. I think wh where we look at it as an academic medical center, we want to be Target and Walmart. Target and Walmart said, we do some things really, really well, but we also want to be out there. So at Jefferson, our, our mission is healthcare with no address. You know, we want five years from now, and we have a lot of issues just like everybody else, but we want five years from now for you to define Jefferson not by where we are, but the care and caring and transparency that you talked about. That's where we need to get to, and I think that's where we all need to start to commit to to create a very different healthcare system. <clears throat> well, I've been asked to read the tea leaves and foretell the future of American healthcare tonight. And the starting point is, there's really not a lot of love out there for our healthcare system. Uh, people really don't love having a $3,000 annual deductible. Uh, they don't love constant co-pays. Uh, medical bankruptcy is a unique to the American language. It's not something that people love. And uh, the constant drama that we have, mass mobilization, people flooding town halls to scream at their member of Congress who are trying to take their health care away or poised to do it. Uh, people know more and more that in other countries, uh, health care is much simpler and much less expensive, and it's universal. Uh, markets, and, and we do have a partially market-based system, are supposed to make things more efficient. Ours is more of a hideous mess. 18% of our GDP, where peer nations, Canada, Germany, what have you, hover around 11%. Much higher expenditure per person on health care in the U.S. with lower life expectancy than in peer nations. Uh, we're really not doing very well. So the future, I think, is can only be one thing, and that is we are going to have socialized medicine in about 10 years. Might be a little more, might be a little less. It's not gonna be in the next election cycle. It's not gonna happen with one apocalyptic piece of legislation. Uh, it's going to be incremental and stuttering, uh, but it's going to rely on the vision of a universal socialized system, probably along a single payer model. There are different ways to socialize healthcare, but that's the one that has the most traction in the reformist world. Uh, it's gonna happen in a few phases. Phase one will be what's happening now, a conflict within the Democratic Party, where you have people flooding town hall meetings flooding their state party convention meetings, demanding that universal health care be part of the agenda. Uh, you see this in California, uh, the state that's been the first in many things, whether it's electing Ronald Reagan or same-sex marriage, and now their lieutenant governor and attorney general, who young guys, up-and-comers, are supporting the need, are supporting universal health care. Uh, Kamala Harris, their junior senator as well. Uh, 16 senators in the Democratic Party recently signed on to this. It's pretty noncommittal, uh, but it's a start. The next phase of this will be key players in the private sector latching onto it, realizing that health care costs are a huge drag on competitiveness and are not good for entrepreneurial startups and are a real burden 
already the more switched on plutocrats like Charlie Munger or Berkshire Hathaway uh, have, are already pushing this line. Third, the Republican Party is not going to completely capitulate to this, but key players in the Republican Party are going to take this on as their own. Uh, you're going to find out that the modal GOP voter is not especially dedicated to radiologists making $800,000 a year and is not passionate about shareholder value for people who own stock in Eli Lilly. I know that may sound fanciful now, given that the Republican Party is doing very different things about health care. Uh, but think about how strange borderline science fiction our present is, where you have <coughs> Democratic Party officials and think tanks fighting tooth and nail to defend uh, the right-wing health care plan developed by the Heritage Institute and then first implemented by a right-wing Republican governor of Massachusetts. I'm talking about the Affordable Care Act. That's our reality. And I think that, uh, that once things get to that point, key players in, in Washington and the Republican will, will fold very quickly. The most difficult part of this will be the bloody civil war within the Democratic Party, which you see right now where you have an old guard that is dedicated to its donor class and irrigated by constant streams of cash from big pharma and from big insurance. <clears throat> there will be a lot of keening and wailing and gnashing of the teeth uh, from the American Medical Association, just as there was when Medicare was passed into law in 1965. But more and more doctors who have a difficult time just getting paid for the work they do are going to latch onto this and already are. So that's the future I see. But again, I think the first part is going to be the hardest, the Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, one vivid example of this, when you have EpiPens going up in price suddenly from $100 to $600, uh, it turns out that the CEO of that company, Heather Bresch, is the daughter of a Democratic senator, of Joe Manchin from West Virginia who says he's very proud of his daughter and what she's doing. Uh, I think we're going to see some real house cleaning within the Democratic Party, and uh, it's going to be painful and disruptive. Uh, but the younger heads in the party who want a future are already switching on, and they're deeply conflicted. I was pleasantly surprised to see Cory Booker of New Jersey sign on uh, to this <coughs> call for single-payer health care. Again, it's pretty noncommittal. He's someone who I would not be surprised if it came out that he you know, sacrificed a goat by the light of the moon to please Johnson & Johnson. Uh, I could easily imagine that. But ultimately, people, politicians have to go with where the votes are. And ultimately, think tanks that are attached to the Democratic Party, like the Center for American Progress, are going to have to uh, break a little with their donors and go more to where the votes are because more and more people are looking at foreign countries and seeing if the systems they have now, even our great commander in chief has compared Australia's socialized system favorably to ours. We have a different starting point, of course, and it's going to take, I think, 10 years, and it's going to be stuttering, and it's not gonna happen all at once. But in 10 years, we are going to have socialized healthcare in the United States, and most of us are going to be a lot better for it. Thank you. Thank you to, the, to everybody on the panel. I, I want to do kind of a sort of a, a quick go around question. Um, I don't want to stay too much in the weeds of politics, but just we'll, we'll do one two part question. The current tax bill pending uh, has a, the repeal of the individual mandate from Obamacare. If that becomes law, what does that mean in the short run? I'd like to get everybody's uh, opinion on that. And then secondly, uh, we've had a couple of calls, several calls for bipartisanship and a prediction of long-term bipartisanship. Um, but at the moment, we can't even get the CHIP program uh, reauthorized and paid for, which is which started as a bipartisan program and has had bipartisan support for, for 20 years. Um, so, like your comment on the current tax proposal uh, involving the individual mandate and the reauthorization of CHIP. Great, Craig. I, I think the first point I'd like to make, I, as I listened to each of the speakers, there were elements of what each said that are, are really powerful, with the exception of my friend at the far end here. I think you're <laughs> totally out to lunch, but that, that's okay. <laughs> um, let, let, me, let me just say this, that 
that the, the, the whole idea, the four <coughs> concepts that, that you talk about are key to the future of healthcare. And, and Mike, competition is at the heart of a system that will work, no doubt. Steve, you, you are in the midst of, right now, you are in the midst of a transformational moment in Philadelphia. Once we, through facilitated health networks, put a, pro a, a program in place that pays only for outcomes, that pays a lower base, and calls for collaboration, real-time transparent data, so that not only members and physicians have an idea of what's going on, but we as the payer and the provider are working collaboratively to provide the best point, the best care at the best point in the system. It's coming. And it's the health insurers working with the forward-thinking health systems who are driving it. So now to answer your question. Sure. In terms of, in terms of uh, the tax bill and the impact, I, I don't want to, I don't know enough to get into what it means to the average American, uh, but I will tell you that the mandate, the mandate for the first four years of the Affordable Care Act really has had very little impact. The, if, a, if a young millennial wants to pay a, a cable bill or pay a heating bill, they're doing that before they're signing up and they're willing to pay the fine. But I have to tell you, uh, we've been, we are the only insurer in five county Philadelphia, we're one of two insurers in the, in the state of New Jersey that have remained on the exchanges all four years. Our membership has grown every year. So what we find this year is the administration decided to re reduce the length of time that someone could sign up to stop advertising and helping people sign up. They're coming out in droves. We're going to release our numbers in the next week. They, they might be down a little bit, but it will only be marginal. So there might be a small percentage of people because they're, they're, the mandate is taken away who say, oh, good, I don't have to worry about paying that fine, but it's a very small percentage. So that's, that's the key. Second question, remind me again. Chip. Chip. Chip reauthorization, in my opinion, will happen. I just believe that the, the, the pressure of, of through whether it's the folks coming out to town halls, uh, uh, the conversations with ind individual members, uh, both, both parties and both houses of Congress, that ultimately when push comes to shove, uh, when they package everything, hopefully by the end of the year, which is the timeline, uh, the, the cooler heads will prevail, and those in the middle will begin to have a dialogue around how we can work around leadership where we need to, to find common ground. I'll share a little bit about what we saw overseas, um, because with any <coughs> system, whether we went to Brazil, we went to Honduras, we went to Japan, there has to be a solid tax base to pay for it with universal health care. Without that tax base coming in, systems will become bankrupt. And as we met with people in France, and I don't know if you, any of you read, there was a New York Times article in September that did an Olympics of global health care. And the U.S. was pitted against Singapore, England was pitted against Australia, and so <laughs> forth. France came out at the top. Why did France come out at the top? According to the editors of the New York Times, they said because it was more accessible to all of French citizens. It's interesting, though, because as we talk to politicians, we talk to policymakers, we talk to hospital administrators, CEOs, medical device CEOs, they all have the same concern, is that there's not enough taxpayer base going into their system. And this is certainly going to be an issue if we continue with uh, the, the individual mandate. Will there be enough to, to quantify the tax base to keep up the level of health care that we need? In France, they're calculating that in 20 years, 17 <coughs> to 20 years, they won't have enough money. You read about this every day about the UK as well. So there is certainly an issue with the tax base. How are we going to pay for that? And so I think, with all due respect to my <coughs> friend Chase, I don't know if that's actually likely. So going back to the individual mandate here in the United States, I think it would certainly be a benefit to reduce that and to make it more of an option to, to create more competitiveness in the marketplace. Michael. Yeah, uh, before I get to the question, I, just, I want to <clears throat> just kind of address a couple of issues that keep coming up here. One is on the cost of our system and the cost of other systems. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at it, in, it'd be the percentage of GDP, or you look at it in dollars per capita, we spend more than anyone else. And we can get into the reasons why on this, and I, and I, hope, I hope we will get a debate on that. However, I just want to point out, if you want to look over the last 20 years, the average annual increase in health care costs in various countries, we're actually in the middle of the pack. 
Our average annual increase for the last 20 years, year over year, has been 4.9%. In the UK, it's been 5%. In Sweden, 6.1% on average. Uh, in Australia, 5.3%. So we actually are growing at a slower rate than many of these countries with single-payer socialized health care systems on a year-over-year -year basis, and they will eventually overtake us uh, in, in the cost many years out. But it's because we started at a much larger base than, than we're looking at. The second thing I just want to hit is these, these studies on medical bankruptcies. <clears throat> Most of these stem from a methodology that was developed by Steffi Woolhandler at Harvard. And what they do is they say if you declare bankruptcy and you owe even one dollar in medical debt, then they call it a medical bankruptcy. If you want to look at medical costs being the cause of bankruptcy, there's st several studies out of USC and some other places that look at it, about 3% of all bankruptcies in the United States are actually caused because of the person's health care costs. Now that's 3% too many, but it's nowhere near the level of medical bankruptcies that is often attributed to in, in these other studies where you get 30 percent, 50 percent, and, and so on and so Now, to answer the actual, actual question, I think CHIP, there is no doubt that CHIP is going to be reauthorized. <coughs> we should note that the, under the ACA, it was envisioned that CHIP would go away. That was part of the original legislation that basically because of the subsidies under ACA, they were going to replace CHIP. And then people got nervous about it and they extended it for a couple, two years, I believe it was. And now that two years has expired, and they're talking about extending it again, which is testimony to the fact that in no government program ever goes away, no matter how temporary it, it, its original purpose was. But it was, so it will be uh, extended again for another two years, and then we'll go through this all uh, again in a couple of years. In terms of the individual mandate, the individual mandate falls primarily and hardest on low-income people. The vast majority, something like more than two-thirds of people who are are hit by the penalty under the end for not uh, buying insurance and have to pay the penalty on the individual mandate have incomes under fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, this is primarily a middle income and lower income individuals who are hit by the cost of the individual mandate. But my big problem with the individual mandate is I think it is deeply antithetical to the American idea. This is the first and only time that I'm aware of that government is requiring individuals to buy a specific government designed product simply by the virtue of the fact that they live and are an American citizen. And I think that deprivation of, a, of individual choice is deeply contrary to the American spirit of individual liberty. And for that reason alone, I think it should be repealed. Can I, can I just two quick, three quick points, Mike? I, I think in, uh, in terms of uh, CHIP going away, part of it was, <coughs> yes, the, the, the subsidized exchange products, but also that was part of the expansion of Medicaid managed yeah. care, where people and in some places they yeah, didn't yeah, fall but, in. But, yes, but right. your, yeah, your point is, is, is exactly right. But the truth of the matter is the <coughs> lower income folks that you reference, the subsidies, they're not the ones that we were seeing staying away. The subsidies were real for them, whether you, you, yeah. you like the subsidy no, no. system or not. They right. were real, yes. and they were attracted to it. I firmly believe that you can get the same results by shifting from a subsidy system to a tax credit system, where, where folks realize that if they are proactive about their health care, there is the ability to, to have a savings. Yeah, I, was, like we, so, like we get in, I think we yeah, should yeah, talk a lot about yeah, changing the whole so, tax treatment health care right, right, to the vast. Right. But I, I, just, yeah. I just, just a point of clarification. Yeah. So I would start by saying, Chase, you've done what nobody's ever been able to do. Uh, Dan Humphrey and I are 100% in lockstep. You are on a really cool drug, and, 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 and <laughs> you know, it's, it's not happening. But um, um, I think from, uh, from, from the tax bill, I, I wrote an op-ed for, uh, for the Hill that basically said that if, if, if President Trump was brilliant and what he was trying to do with the, um, with, with, with the tax and with the CSRs to insurance companies was to create a crisis so we then come out better from that crisis, uh, um, and actually had a chance to talk to some folks in his administration around the concept of a 9-11 type get-together. At the end of the day, if you think about 9-11, um, we, uh, we first had the Democrats blaming the Republicans, the Republicans blamed the Democrats, but then they got together and said, we failed to keep this country safe. And that's what started the 9-11 Commission. They got really smart people under the radar. If we could get to the point where, where, where we failed, and like any tsunami or hurricane or, or, or horrible thing, people get hurt. But if we can say we failed, the Democrats could truly say, to your point, that the ACA did not do what it meant to do. Republicans say we didn't have a better answer. And you could literally create a 9-11 type commission. I wrote a book uh, that really looked at 
what if everybody in the ecosystem through a science fiction event started to look in the mirror, and out of that came the 12 disruptors to the demise of the old health care that were so, so compelling that both the Democrats and the Republicans used it as a common health care platform. And Sanjay Gupta said, you know, it's a science fiction book. That's it, that's, but but, but here's, the, here's, here's the issue with bipartisanship. We have a great example of bipartisanship. Um, uh, Governor Florio is here at a time when, uh, when people actually talked and, and uh, uh, a bit pre-cable news, not that I'm dating <coughs> you, but uh, um, uh, uh, really where, where, where legislators uh, legislated. Um, I happened to be at a, at a, a dinner uh, during the campaign. Uh, and... Um, I had spent a lot of time, nine years in Tampa. I was with uh, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren's uh, campaign manager, uh, Zeke Emanuel, and two or three other folks uh, of that um, uh, with, with similar bends. And listening to that discussion, it was, well, how could anybody vote for President Trump? Didn't they see that Atlantic article? And didn't they read the op-ed in the New York Times? And didn't they see what Rachel Maddow said? So nobody's going to vote for him. And I said, no, I was just in Tampa, and they said, how can anybody vote for Hillary Clinton? Didn't they see Hannity last night? Didn't, didn't they read the New York Post? So bipartisanship is really a, a function of the fact that nobody listens to anybody else. We, we, had, a, we had a chance to uh, be with Bill Clinton, and he said the new segregation in Florida is politics. It used to be racial or religious. It's now, I don't want to be in a gated community with, if there's anybody, you know, Democrats or Republicans or anybody that doesn't believe in, in gun rights or that kind of thing. So until we get over that, I think one of the things we have to recognize is a lot of the problems that are there in healthcare are because of you. And I don't mean that to be funny, but you don't demand of us what you would demand of anything else. You know, and the reason I don't think we're going to get to universal health care <coughs> is because I don't think you're right. I don't think everybody is demanding. I think people are saying, oh, my God, I don't want to be like that United Kingdom. I don't want to be like, you know, that, you know where, where people die because they can't get an MRI. That's not true, by the way. I mean, if you want to know where we're at, Don, when Don Berwick was up for CMS, you remember this, Dan, and he made the horrible mistake of uh, saying, um, you know, I think we could learn some from the United Kingdom. And it was like that scene in The Exorcist where your head went around 360 degrees and, you know, the senators were, oh, my God, the United Kingdom isn't that evil. So until we get over that, to, the, to your point, there are, we can learn from other places. But there are things that we do better than other places that most of the population would not tolerate if we did the other places. My Wharton thesis was on the difference in, in global health care following <coughs> money. And, in fact, there is, there is no perfect health care system. If there was, we would all follow it. So I, I think things need to change. I think it needs to start with the consumer. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I think you guys have to say we're mad as hell. We're not going to take it anymore, whether that's billing, whether that's transparency, whether that's providers, whether that's insurers or pharma. And if you did that, I think the market would start to, to react differently. Okay, so I, I've heard a theme here, uh, but from two diametrically different points of view, and that is the role of market forces in healthcare as a sector of our economy. <coughs> I've heard calls for unleashing market forces in healthcare, and I've heard comments to the effect of market forces fail, aren't appropriate to healthcare, and we need to go into a, a command kind of system uh, run by government. Okay, who's right? I want to go down, and I want to have everybody talk about <coughs> the way in which you think the market and market economics, which dominate our lives in so many, so many spheres, whether or not they apply in healthcare, if so, why? How do we bring them in? And if not, why? And how do we get them out? I, th I think simple, simply everybody is right partially and everybody is wrong partially. Um, <coughs> I do think it's important, though, that we, we look at the system factually. Um, you talk about healthcare being less expensive in other countries. Well, let's get to the root cause Pharma pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical manufacturers, they are inventing, they research just incredible drugs that save lives. The United States of America, one way, shape, or form, pays for 99, 90 cents on every drug. Pharmaceuticals, number one. Seven out of the ten top pharmaceutical <coughs> companies spend more on advertising than they do on research. I, I, I think it's important.
important to, to understand, and, and every time I get a chance to talk, I'm just going to throw a factoid out there, because it is a fact. Check it out. And, and so now, to answer your question, I said in my opening comments, and I stand by it, the best system is a system that takes the best of government, and, and Mike may, you know, we, we probably have a little bit of a disagreement yeah. here, but takes the best of government, <clears throat> uh, whether that be from an appropriate regulation point of view, from just making sure that we all adhere to certain quality standards and the like, in partnership with the private sector, putting each individual, whether it be a member or patient, at the center of everything we do. Then we can take the best of the private sector, which I'm telling you, it's happening in Medicare Advantage, with the MACRA program and other things where, where costs are really beginning to be controlled in Medicare Advantage, and members are happy. And when they're not happy about their private sector payer, they can go to government, and things have to change or your star rating's going to be hurt. Medicaid managed care, point blank, the, the, the Oregon <coughs> study, a uh, very limited study, by the way, but if you look across the board, we're one of the largest uh, uh, Medicaid managed care companies in the country, you look across the board and you compare populations that stayed in fee-for-service traditional Medicaid or move to Medicaid managed care with a, a young single mom with two or three children who carry an insurance card and are in a medical home with a primary care physician and a circle of, of support around them. Not only is their health status improved, but costs go down. And in fact, emergency room visits go down significantly. It's that partnership between private sector and public sector coming together uh, where appropriate, and, and frankly, at the center of it, working with the individual clinician and the system around that clinician to make sure that someone in a medical home gets the care they need at the level they need it. If we start with who's right and who's wrong, we're, right. we're already doomed. And that's kind of the political climate we're in right now, um, as Dr. Plasco was saying, that it, there's such extremism and such passion and emotion about I'm right, you're wrong, and it's you against us. That's, that's where we're at right now. And I think we need to start at a more level and accepting playing field. I teach innovation and entrepreneurship at the Fox School of Business at Temple. And one of the things I do with my students is I say yes and when we have brainstorming sessions because we don't want to misclassify or, or excuse any potential idea that could come forward, no matter how crazy or even somewhat illegal they might be because we want to foster that creativity, the energy, the excitement of what could possibly be. And so I'm excited that we're having this forum today that we could discuss what could possibly be. And it's so important to get a myriad of voices, your voices, our voices, and not just the policymakers. Because without the voices, we don't know what could possibly be. So in terms of who's right, who's wrong, I'm gonna say I don't think there's necessarily a right and a wrong. We need to get all the different opinions, all of the different solutions out on the table first, and then start seeing who is going to be best affected and sometimes worst affected, because there will be no utopia, a utopia in healthcare. And even to Dr. Clasco's point of, you know, he had said, well, we're, we're lazy. We also, as individuals, need to assume a responsibility in this, assume a responsibility for our own healthcare, for our own care of our, of our being, what we eat, who we see, what we do. Personal responsibility plays a very large part in healthcare, which is something that I think many Americans take for granted and shove off to somebody else's, to somebody else. I, I, I'm gonna jump in right here yeah. since I was missed the first time around. Good. I, <laughs> there, there is real conflict in healthcare and there should be because our system is terrible. And there are millions of people in a rich country that don't have healthcare. That requires conflict, I'm sorry. Uh, and thank God we have it. Uh, you know, meeting in the middle and bipartisanship is great, but where is that middle? And that, where that middle is is determined by where the centers of gravity are. Right now, at least within a large part of the country, the boundary of what's acceptable is shifting left to socialized medicine and to a frank discussion about what that means and how to get it. That's good. Uh, you know, market incentives, the best way to reform American healthcare is to squeeze out as much as possible the private sector. Look at what works in every other country. Look at it. This is not 
utopia. I cannot believe it when people describe socialized health care as utopian, when this is the only proven, demonstrably effective way to give everyone quality health care while containing costs, the opposite of what we have now. And the idea that uh, patients are consumers who are going to respond to market incentives, like if you get free health care, you'll get HIV for the fun of it, or just develop you know, type 2 diabetes for fun because suddenly you have health care. That's belied by all of the evidence in every country with universal health care, which has much better health indicators on all of these measures, you know, typically. So, you know, it, there's, there's a need for confidence. And by the way, the Bolshevik position that I'm proposing to you tonight would be <laughs> utterly uncontroversial at a meeting of any center-right or even far-right party in any peer nation, whether it's France, Germany, what have you. And the idea that, you know, they don't think they're all running out of money. You can find some estimates, I'm sure. But there's an incredible amount of untaxed wealth and income. Raise taxes on rich people to make this more solvent. I mean, it's absolutely feasible. All right, let, let's try to start talking a little bit more back to some of the, some of the actual... I'm I'm in the middle of this. This is yeah. the <laughs> actual facts. This is the first time I've ever been moderate, by there the way. You yeah. There you go. Can yeah. you yeah. calm him down? So, I'm so, worried so, about yeah, <laughs> Introduce a couple of things. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of that CNN commercial where they have the apple and those little cherry peas go by or something. It's still this an is apple. apple. It's still an apple. So let's, let's introduce a couple of the facts here. One is, US, why does the U.S. spend more money on health care than anyone else in the world? Because we can. An economist will tell you health care is a superior good. And what that means is that in, as expenditures rise as incomes rise. And actually, about 80% of the difference between our spending and other countries is largely a function of, of average annual consumption per capita, simply the fact that we're a much wealthier company. We spend money on health care versus other goods and services because we all want them forever. Do that on. In terms of the outcomes, there's very little data actually comparing outcomes between countries that's actually very good. Uh, the common metrics, for example, things like life expectancy are lousy measures comparison yeah. between health care systems. Uh, it, actually, if you want, uh, between 50 and 90 percent between us and other countries on a life expectancy is due to murder, suicide, automobile accidents, and drug overdoses uh, that are not simply a function of health care systems or a function of other, other, other issues. In fact, in fact, if you want to look at the, you know, one, an interesting, just fun fact, Cuba's high life expectancy is almost entirely due to their lack of automobiles in the country. That is the largest, that is the companies for about 80% of the difference of Cuba's rise in life expectancy, the fact that nobody drives down, down there, or they drive those old, you know, cars we all see, all see in the pictures, so you want to look at those sorts of things. Third, if you want to look at what, you know, the cause of so many of the problems, I agree, the healthcare system stinks. If you want to look at what, tracing many of the causes of it, you can simply look to things in the government. We heard earlier about EpiPen. How did the EpiPen costs go up so much? because of a lack of competition enforced by the government. At the time the EpiPen price was raised, there were three competing EpiPen alternatives that were waiting approval by the FDA, but were not allowed on the market. There were multiple EpiPen alternatives available in Europe, but not allowed to be marketed in the US because the FDA was blocking their introduction in the United States. So we have government actually denying competition, and that's allowing costs to go up. Or look at the Medicare system. 55 to 58 trillion dollars in the red, according to the program's own trustees. We can't pay for the system as it is, so why would we want to expand it to other people? I think those are things you've got to actually look at in terms of facts before we go off into something and saying that we simply want to do something because it sounds nice to give everybody health care. Look, I, th I think, I think it, God, it's really hard for me to be a moderate, but um, um, I think it, it, it is somewhere in the middle. Um, I think at the end of the day, the government's job is to make sure that, that whatever happens is fair. I, th I think we can all agree with that. I think the market works. I think the problem sometimes is when the government gets in the way of the market or when guilds get in the way of the market. So the telehealth. It's asinine that uh, Jeff Connect can't be in certain states, including Absolutely. New Jersey, because the doctors there or the, or, the, or the medical side has convinced the state that we don't want Pennsylvania doctors there. It would be like if when ATMs got started, you need a different ATM card for every state. You know, so, you know, John Scully says, let's stop talking about telehealth. We don't talk about telebanking. It's because that got, that got unregulated. The, mar the market generally works. But here's the problem. Partly because of the government, but partly because of some other issues, 
We don't let that market in. We have way too many hospitals in Philadelphia, way too many hospitals in Philadelphia. We're about 25% overbedded. But if, God forbid, a, a leapfrog B hospital, uh, instead of just going under and there would be other, other hospitals that could take that, which is probably the best for the community, the market would work, they're going to convince them to sell to a for, pro for profit. They can do that for a couple years so that the, we won't have to deal with the employees, et cetera. So at the end of the day, I, w the, the, part, the main reason I don't agree with, with your government taking over, it really assumes that government's going to do the right thing. And if I believed that, I'd be on your side. And if you look at the Affordable Care Act, one of the things that is just ridiculous in this country is that we're all spending in our hospitals $250 million a year to turn our handwriting into PDF and hand it to Verona, Wisconsin, to Judy Faulkner and Epic. And I like Judy. But, but when you think about the Affordable Care Act, almost everybody said one of the things that they should have done is open source coding for EMRs, almost like the VA, so that literally the legacy EMR should almost be free, and then the market should have you do apps. Well, Judy was President Obama's advisor, who has the one EMR that is the least open to that open source coding. So if, if I believe that the government would say, you know, we're just going to, our only job is to make sure as a politician that everybody gets what they want. That would be fine. I think the market generally does a better job of that, but the market is cruel. And, and where I think government has, has, has an absolute important role is to make sure that nobody, no class of citizen is getting, is getting the short end from the market. One, one other thing about the market versus the government. I, I worked at a state institution for, for, uh, for nine years. And when you looked at how that ran versus a private institution, it, it, it was very different. Uh, one of the senators there talked about Florida is the center of waste, fraud, and abuse. They had a six, $600 million fraud thing uh, where, where people would take Social Security numbers down to Miami and charge the government Medicare and say, I just did an appendectomy on you know, Chase or whatever. They, it, got, it, got, it got hit because somebody said, I did a hist hysterectomy on Dan Hilferty. And somebody, somebody says, you know, this doesn't seem right. This is a true story. <laughs> and then their supervisor said, you know what, just pay it. It's too much trouble to, to, to deal with it. A whistleblower saw it and, and, and did that. And, and our senator of Florida compared that to when he went up to Washington. He bought a, he, he bought a, uh, a, a large screen TV. And literally on his way out, he got texted from Visa, did you just buy a large screen TV? Because they have all these algorithms. Why would somebody from Florida buy a large screen TV? To the cost, I'll say one thing. I agree. Look, we have lots of work to do, whether we're an insurer or provider or pharma. But we can't ignore the social stuff. We have six academic medical centers in the city that we're incredibly proud of. Philadelphia has the largest discrepancy in life expectancy of any city in the country. Let me say that again. A baby born today in 2104 in 19147, it's in the Society of Hills, will live to 2104. A baby born in North Strawberry Mansion, 8.2 miles away, will not make it to 29 today. And, and, and that's despite having Penn, <coughs> Jefferson, Temple, Drexel, et cetera, and IBC and, and all the great stuff. So at the end of the day, that's what we haven't done well. We have to redefine what a not-for-profit is. I mean, when you think about it, you know, what every, what every board should do, and I've told my board, what every board should do is make 30% of our incentives not-for-profits. Dan's board, my board, Amy Gutman's board, and say, you know what, 30% of your incentive is going to be improving health in Philadelphia. Because you know what that would do? That would get us to actually talk to each other. This is the only city in the country where the presidents never talk to each other. Philadelphia Citizen, I think, did a, did a thing where they got all the presidents together. The first time in five years they got in the We're very proud of our chance to get Amazon, but if I was competing against Philadelphia, I would mention that Philadelphia, according to Becker's, is number 28 out of 43 uh, metropolitan areas in health. And that includes quality of hospitals. Of course, we, we love to talk about Penn or Jefferson or some of those others, but, but we, have, we have some issues. So at the, the issue is, I, I couldn't agree with, more with what everybody said. There's no reason to blame anybody. I, I, could, I could tell you more things that Jefferson has to change than you could. I'm sure Dan could do the same thing around insurers. And, and, and we have to put some of it on you. But at the end of the day, we have to start to talk to each other and say, we're not going to take this anymore. It's not Dan's fault. It's not Steve's fault. It's not the government's fault. 
we have to figure out how we can make Philadelphia a healthier place. So just the point, Steve, in terms of uh, if we cover people in Philadelphia in those pockets that you describe, that's where you will find the largest number of uninsured individuals. Right. And now there's, there's other determinants, I mean, violence, drugs, op opioid epidemic. We, could, we should have a session on the opioid epidemic. And frankly, it's one area where government and the private sector are starting to play along. 1,600 Philadelphians die on the streets of an opioid overdose something June. So now from the governor, from the federal government, decisions that we're making as an insurer is, is reducing uh, prescription lengths for, for first-time uh, uh, prescriptions on opioids. It's finally a collaborative effort to address those areas. But if you look at those zip codes, there's one thing missing. Folks are not insured. And they now have the ability to be insured. And, and, and Chase, you know, that if you can if think about it from even from your perspective, if someone has a, an insurance, but no, I'm, I'm not being critical because you're a civil rights attorney. What you do every day to make sure that people are seen in an, in an equal light by society, that's laudable. So what we have a different perspective on, on the system. But I think we could agree that if somebody has a card that they can go, whether it's a primary care physician or some, some certified clinic where they can get proactive care or care when something terrible is happening to them, that's the start of a good system. Regardless Why we need socialized comes. medicine. Well, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, Chase, may, question. Do, and by the way, wait, 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 you have, wait, 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 have, 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 I think you've got to look at things like lifestyle. Yep. I think you've got to look at obesity. You've got to, you You're mentioned right, the opioid right. epidemic. But I think you have to look at, at the criminal justice system. I think you have to look, at, I mean, God forsake that we should turn the opioid epidemic for another chance, like we did with the crack epidemic, so that we can go into minority neighborhoods and roust a whole bunch of people and throw them in jail. I mean, that's certainly not going to help health care. I, I, I think we need to look at education. We need to have a better school system, one that treats minorities and people of color as fairly. I think we need to have, uh, and basically nothing actually improves health as much as economic growth, as far as the fact that as, as incomes rise in a society, people's health care rises. So I think those are things we need Chase, to do. Chase, wait, Chase, I will make you a challenge. I will get in front of the uh, Pennsylvania Medical Society and tell them we should have socialized medicine. If you're willing to get up in front of the Pennsylvania Bar Society and tell them we should have socialized law in malpractice. I mean, the, sure. the, the contingency sure. system should go away. We'll give, <laughs> and then uh, who are we going to sell all the Gulf Streams to that the plaintiffs' lawyers have? Fine. I mean, Wait, I got a challenge. Court coverage. I, I got a idea. challenge. I mean, Let's the six of us get in a room, and we don't come out until we have a new health care system. Oh. Yeah. I, I think it could happen. Well, I, 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 I yeah, think, no. I think, I think it that, could happen. I'm telling you, Michael. I, 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 what if I, only five of us come out? Be, uh, <laughs> that would be a, that'd be an interesting exercise. I didn't say we all had to come out. <laughs> yeah. Only one. Uh, well, you know, we like to bring people together. That, that, that handshake, I think, is very, very important. And Michael just aptly uh, laid out, uh, I think, two years of World Affairs Council programming. Um, so come back, <laughs> come back for our discussion on growth, education, um, lifestyle, et cetera. Um, okay, I want to collect questions from you all. Uh, we're going to have staff go down the ends of the aisles, um, and we, we won't, obviously won't get to all of them, but we'll get to a few. While they're being collected, I want to uh, I want to change the subject in a, in a kind of a wrap in a little bit of a wrap up way. Obviously, we can't we can't tie all the loose ends together. All right, so here's my here's my last question. Um, you could have had a panel of really distinguished people sit on a dais in Philadelphia in the year uh, uh, two, in the year 1900 and talk about all the problems in the system, the economic system involving the horse economy uh, of, uh, of the city. There were half a million horses in Philadelphia in the year 1900. They generated a lot of waste. There, they involved a lot of employment, right? And you could have had a very serious scholarly discussion about the horse economy and how to make it better. But uh, in 1930, you would have looked back and said, why were we having that conversation? That economy was, was about to be blown up. So my question for all of you is, is everything we've talked about here in some sense irrelevant? That a generation from now, the disruption of technology introduced into medicine uh, from uh, gene editing and personalized drugs 
uh, to uh, telemedicine, digital uh, information sharing, is that going to make all of these questions about how we organize and insure and pay for health care kind of fundamentally ir irrelevant? Yes, no, real, real, quick, it, real, quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. I believe that, that technology has a role in achieving all the goals that you laid out, but at the end, it is the human touch. It is a human being, a physician who was in 1900 during the horse economy and is in the year 2025 in the technology uh, economy, high technology economy. At the end of the day, it's a clinician interacting at some level interacting with their patient uh, and using think, using technology as a as a tool let me, let me say this. i think technology is going to make the problem worse because it is going to generate marvelous things at enormous expense we're going to come down to the, the designer drugs where they can look at your dna and come up with a drug mm -hmm. that will treat your cancer or whatever but it's going to cost a fortune and we're still going to have the problem of paying for it i think the big problem is that we haven't had any disruption in healthcare. Basically, our healthcare model would be basically the technology aside would be recognizable by someone in ancient Rome. I mean, basically, if Publius had a bad elbow, you know, he went down to his local physician and he gave the physician a sheep or something, and the sheep, you know, the physician did a couple of tests on him, you know, sniffed his urine and things, and did all those sort of things, and then he then he said, okay, you know, here's here's the way we're going to treat your elbow. It's almost exactly the same thing that's taking place 2,000 years later today. I don't think we sniff a lot of urine. Yeah. No. Well, <laughs> no, no, wait. Today you do a test. Uh -oh. today did you do, Publius today. ride his horse to the doctor? <laughs> yeah. He did. He did. Yeah. But, you know, so but, but, I mean, but, basically but, it's the same system. The health care and education are the only two systems that I know have basically had no change in, in, in how they, they take place over the last several thousand years, and, and largely they're created. Government has basically taken over and regulated these systems. So in one, in one minute, I, I think that artificial insemination, uh, oh, okay, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's my, it's my OBGYN background. Uh, artif artificial intelligence and um, uh, deep learning and, and machine cognition will fundamentally change what we do. But then exactly to your point, Dan, um, is that we can't keep accepting medical students based on science PP and MedCats and organic chemistry grades and then be amazed that doctors aren't more empathetic, sensitive, and creative. As you know, at Jefferson, we started, you so, yeah, we started the first medical school. We're actually choosing students based on emotional intelligence. Why? Because there's a 100% chance there'll be an IBM Watson next to me that'll be much better at, at taking a picture of the baby and saying what's genetically wrong with that baby. I've delivered uh, almost 2,000 babies, and um, it's easy to deliver a seven-pound baby from a normal 25-year-old. It's easy for me to say I'm on the other end, but, but it, 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 it's incredibly difficult delivering an unscheduled Down syndrome baby. And 100% of the time, the first question that, that mom will ask is, what does this mean? And I've watched good obstetricians say, well, it means your baby's 21st chromosome is off or whatever. I've watched great obstetricians get to what does it mean is, what does it mean to my image of a perfect baby? And here's the thing. IBM Watson and Google Brain will be able to be much better at memorizing every genomic sequence of what's wrong with that baby. It'll never get that, what does it mean to my image of a perfect baby, where a great obstetrician says, this is a beautiful baby. I'm going to get you together with other people that have had beautiful babies like that. IBM Watson just took the radiology boards and did better than 60% of radiology fellows. If radiologists don't figure out a way to, to be more valuable than the robot, then, then, we're, then we're in trouble. We don't need them. And that's what you said. And I would say, too, that technology has done some really great things in terms of creating less invasive surgeries, which has uh, led to a reduction in blood transfusions, for instance. But I totally agree, and I mentioned I'm a, I'm a cancer survivor. And my story actually started out with, and I had ovarian cancer, which is one of the most lethal cancers, especially for females. Well, not for males, obviously, unless you, Dan, because you had a hysterectomy. Well, I had a hysterectomy. I'm so glad you did. Good preventative care. You're in real trouble. <laughs> but uh, I, had, I had symptoms of, uh, I was gaining weight in my stomach. I was constipated. I know TMI. But, you know, this could have been anything. But it was because I had that relationship with my primary care who pushed on my belly and said, you know, I think you have a large abdominal mass. You need to be seen immediately. I was stage 1A. Nobody has ever seen stage 1A for ovarian cancer. And it was because of that human touch. So it doesn't matter if I had seen her, like, you know, <coughs> through telemedicine, if there had been I actually tested negative for a CA125, which is the cancer marker for ovarian cancer. So without that human touch, it, it wouldn't have occurred. Mm -hmm. And I think we're actually going to lose that, as many of my, my colleagues said, we're going to lose that human touch with, with advances in technology. Yeah. 
Frank, the problem that we have is not primarily economic, it's not primarily technological, it's political. And the political mess that we've made, we can unmake and get ourselves out of. And I'm sure there's lots of good money to be made in telemedicine, just as there is in online uh, degree programs. And I'm sure they will contribute just as much to you know, the common good as online degree programs. All right, so I've got a stack of questions from the audience, obviously more than we're gonna get to, but I'm gonna try to summarize. Uh, a couple of the questions go to this, this panel saying that the audience and, and, uh, and the people, the broader public that they represent, have a responsibility here. Um, okay, so one question is, if healthcare is a right, doesn't the recipients of healthcare have responsibilities for his or her own health decisions? So we're talking about lifestyle choices. That's one question I wanna pose. The, the second is, uh, if change has to start with the consumer and bringing market, uh, market forces uh, to bear, what should the consumer do? What should be the path of action that people can take? And this doesn't have to be any, everybody, anybody who wants to jump I'll in. I'll start out. Look, I think, yeah. you, I think you know, um, you can be the day after Thanksgiving, you can be uh, at home doing all your holiday shopping in your pajamas watching Game of Thrones. But if you have a stomach ache and you want to get a gastroenterologist to see you, you're going to get on the phone, listen to 11 options, and for an appointment on Wednesday, to your point. Once people say, I'm not gonna do that, and especially once there are some alternatives to that, then that, then that <coughs> changes, then, then those people go out of business. Back in 2004, when I was in Florida, we were the first place that said, we'll give same day mammogram exams, because the average amount of time uh, for mammograms at that time was 4.2 days. Now think about that, it takes two minutes to read a mammogram. But radiologists like to batch read because it's not worth their time, you know, to actually sit on the button and, and read it until there are 50 to read. So 4.2 days, people would go home at night and wait. We decided that we would do same day mammogram results in 2004. We were told that would be possible, it was too expensive. We did it, we advertised it. Within six months, you see every billboard on I-95. We guarantee same day results. So the key is, that's, that is what the market does. And if patients start to demand that, you know, I'm gonna take your tack. I mean, if, if you had to pay your own money for anything, and you got an 87 page bill that was really a Saturday Night Live version of a bill, uh, you know, um, you wouldn't do it. You'd say, I'm not gonna pay this. But you know, the, the issue is that, that Dan's paying it, and then, then what you might get or paying some consumer, of it, you're, you're paying, well, I know, but, but, but the actual check is coming from Dan, and then you get something from Dan that might not be all that decipherable. So the consumers have to wake up. As far as lifestyle, that's a really tough one, because at the end of the day, if I decide to have five speeding tickets, you know, that's the thing, and I'm gonna pay for Mark's auto insurance, but if I decide to be that guy that did the documentary that ate McDonald's, you know, three months in a row, I'm gonna pay, potentially pay the same for health insurance if I'm in a group. The problem has been, does, you know, and maybe you could help us answer I, it. Does I mean, that explain disadvantage why it? this is all backwards after okay. you finish. No, well, I was going to ask you. <laughs> but so wait, wait, wait. You know, that's a little biased. Though. Maybe I was going to say something brilliant. <laughs> all right. This is not a hypothetical question. What happens when people have universal health care? Okay, we don't have to play some freshman philosophy game because there are many peer nations that already have it. And guess what? People in Germany are not going on medical joy rides just for the fun of it. People don't do that. Why do people think that other people are going to do that in the United States? Why? This is the country that has a much higher type 2 diabetes incident rate than countries with socialized medicine. You'd think, I mean, it, it's when people don't have basic health care, especially preventive care, steadily and early on, that they're more likely to develop costly health problems. You know, the idea that someone is just going to get HIV because they can, because now the government, well, they, nobody thinks like that except for in the imagination of, I guess, some, you know, American people who, I, I, I just don't understand where this comes from. There is a clear empirical answer for it, and it's, the answer is, People are more responsible with their bodies and others in places like Germany, the Netherlands, Canada, than here in the U.S. where healthcare access is uncertain for millions of people. All right, let's talk empirical data. Let's talk countries like Germany that have co-payments and deductibles 
and actually require uh, for many of their procedures. You actually have to pay a portion of your pharmaceutical bill in Germany. They actually have recognized that consumers having to make a, have a cost sharing in part of this actually does reduce overutilization. You can go all the way back to the RAND health insurance experiment, which is sort of the gold standard of this of uh, the 1970s that showed that individuals confronted with different levels of deductibles did, did reduce their overall health care spending without changing outcomes, uh, depending on how much they had to pay out of pocket. Uh, you can look at the fact, in fact, there is not. It's actually hard for me to find a single-payer country uh, out there in the world. Uh, if anybody wants to talk to me about what is a single-payer country, uh, I, I'd be really curious, because the vast majority of European countries actually have dual systems in which there is a private insurance market that covers part of the, of the payment system, or in which people can opt out of the government system and still participate in the, in, the, in the private system. Most of them have a consumer payment. In fact, as I say, France, Australia, some of these countries actually, been, consumers pay more out of pocket than do the U.S. Even the ones that have a largely government system, like Sweden and so on, are highly decentralized, in which local governments actually raise most of the tax money and then to fund, to fund their local hospitals rather, rather than it being the centralized government that does that. Uh, the closest I can think of probably is Canada, which actually has a provincial-based system uh, rather than a single, single government system. So single-payer system is still kind of a myth. Okay, we've run out of time. Uh, we call this series uh, Great Debates. Uh, not great conclusions. The conclusion, uh, <laughs> the conclusions are up to you. Um, but I think we've well, given uh, we've given uh, more than more than enough uh, food for thought. Happy holidays, everybody. We're adjourned. Well done. Good to see you. Well done. Yeah, you too. Good luck with everything. I'd love to keep talking. Okay. Uh,